the subject of Piltdown Man. Okay, now just, just before we move on, just think about that. Imagine you lived in that time. Okay, imagine one of your professors were to write that PhD. Imagine it was you. Imagine you got your doctor and your parents are so proud of you that wow, my son, he's, I can call him doctor, or my daughter, I can call her doctor, and you got your PhD, and everything's going great, and what happens 40 years later, 1949, they apply a new method, fluorine testing, to use to determine the date of the fossils. And a trial was made on the fossil of Piltdown Man. The result was astonishing. Okay? During the test, it was realized that the jawbone of Piltdown Man did not contain any fluorine at all. So what that means is that it had remained buried no more than a few years. Okay? It's been buried only a few years. The skull, which contained only a small amount of fluorine, showed that it was only a few thousand years old. Okay? Major difference in the dates. And it was determined that the teeth in the jawbone belonging to an orangutan had been worn down artificially. Somebody physically did this tampering and that the primitive tools that were discovered or were planted uh, with the fossils were simple imitations that had been sharpened with steel implements. So that this, the whole thing was a fake. The whole thing was a forgery and this forgery was revealed to the public in 1953. Now just imagine, just imagine how ridiculous it would be if you, know, you got your you got your doctorate thesis on this, and you feel like a fool afterwards. So it's just something to think about. It's just something that just something to keep in mind that we need to be careful because you know we spend a lot of time in our life doing certain things. We put our effort in certain fields. You know it shouldn't be wasted. It shouldn't be wasted. And you look back and say I wasted my entire life, or I can't believe I fell for that. So it's something important uh, that everyone needs to take into consideration. Then we come to transitional form of Nebraska man. 1917, uh, 1917 Nebraska man. Uh, Hesperopithecus Harold Cooker. Okay, code name. Analysis of the uncovered tooth. So in Nebraska they find a tooth. Okay, I don't know if you can, you can barely see it here. Okay, there's, they found this, this is just a random picture, but they find basically a tooth. Okay, and they said this tooth is evidence for another transitional form. And they got this, you know, nice picture out of a tooth. Now, if you're a scientist, you know that from a tooth you can't draw this picture. I mean, there's, there's virtually not much at all that you can get, you know, but just by seeing a tooth. Okay, so, but anyways, you know, you got this, you got Nebraska man comes along, okay, and what happens later on? They realize that further field work on the site in 1925 reveals that the tooth was falsely identified. Other parts of the skeleton were also found. According to these newly discovered pieces, the tooth belonged neither to a man nor to an ape, but to an extinct pig. So not only did they get the picture wrong, but they got the entire, you know, the entire animal wrong. And it was retracted in the journal Science in 1927. Transitional form, Ramapithecus, 1932. The first incomplete Ramapith uh, specimens of Ramapithecus are found in Nepal on the bank of the Tenoa River. The finder claimed that the jaw was more like a human's than any other fossil ape then known. So later, what happened? More complete specimens of Ramapithecus were found in 1975 and 1976 which showed that it had less human-like uh, than was imagined previously before. So it's also dismissed as evidence once again. So 1932 to 1975. Now imagine if you lived between that time, what stance would you take? Transitional form, Australopithecus. This is a very famous one, so keep this in mind. Australopithecus afarensis, 1974, which is the famous one. How many people have heard of the transitional form Lucy? Okay, so it's very famous. Okay, so Lucy, codename AL288-1. Estimated age 3.2 million years. It has a chimp-sized brain, chimp-sized ribcage and jaw bones, and arms and legs that indicate it walked like a chimp. Now, Lord Zuckerman comes along, which is an expert on the subject. He spends 15 years studying all the various Australopithecus specimens with a team of five experts backed by the British government. Arrived at the conclusion that Australopithecus, in reality, was an ordinary species of ape and very definitely did not walk upright. So here's Lucy, and here's some other specimens. Lucy's very happy, but unfortunately Lucy is being dismissed also as evidence. So what is needed, last point on transitional forms, is that no matter what you find, you know, sci the, you know scientists can keep on looking for these transitional forms, and if you use your power of imagination so much, enough, you can somehow try and find these you know, detailed variations, but what, we're, what we were looking for is not just one or two, or not just a few, or not something that kind of looks like this, but rather something that 
provided as definite evidence. So what we get here is one example of creativity is the face on the moon. So the original photo here, it reveals like there's a face on the moon and all these conspiracy theories go around. Probably if at that time they had email, you'd be getting a bunch of you know, chain mails going all around saying, look, check it out, there's a face on the moon and this is amazing, right? Then in 1976, more detail comes along and say, oh, it's looking less like a face. Then 2007, high resolution picture comes along, 20 meters per pixel, they realize the face is gone. Okay? There's no face on the moon. The only reason why there's a face on the moon that was happening is because these dots that are here are, are the, the errors in the, in the image that are being computer you know, generated by a computer. It's being filled in, it looks like it's a face on the moon. But something actually, that's, you know, that's a famous example that people use. But the cooler thing, the cooler thing is the butterfly alphabet. And this is really cool. Is that there were some researchers, he was analyzing all the wings of the bu butterflies. You know, butterflies have all these different colors. And some, one day he noticed like there's a number, there's a letter there, he took a picture of it. And he was analyzing it and he said, it looks like another one. And then he kept on doing it and they realized, you know what, you can make the entire alphabet out of it. You know, so if you look hard enough, you, can, you got the whole alphabet, you know, so it's not, you know, some people can call it a miracle maybe. You know, some people can call it, you know, the creativity, imagination. But anyways, the point is that these type of things belong in the art classroom, they don't necessarily belong in science class. So we need to differentiate that, we need to understand that. What, it, what else is needed? Beyond transitional forms, you need to a refutation of sudden emergence. What that means is you need to refute the opposite, which is what transitional forms are trying to do. But basically what Darwin is saying here is if numerous species belonging to the same genera or families have really started into life at once, the fact would be fatal to the theory of evolution through natural selection. Fatal. To the question, why do we not find rich fossil fillers uh, fos fossiliferous deposits belonging to these assumed earliest periods prior to the Cambrian system, I can give no satisfactory answer. So what is the Cambrian explosion? Basically it happened, uh, they estimate, f approximately 530 million years ago. And basically what indicates the sudden appearance of hard body animals in the fossil record accompanied by a profound diversification of life on Earth. So you've got all these fossils which are approximately 530 million years old among the oldest developed species you're going to find and everything else before that is extremely simple so what's going on and Darwin realized that and he says unfortunately I can't give you a satisfactory answer to this and until today still people generally can't give a satisfactory answer so that's something else that needs to keep kept in mind what else is needed evidence of an evolutionary mechanism. So you need evidence of certain mechanism that takes place, that's the whole point of the theory. So the mechanism of natural selection has been refuted by the fossil record. And the discovery of the laws of genetics all as well. So look, you know, due to lack of time, we're not gonna get into that point. But by several things, you basically, your cart is empty. So you were searching for these transitional forms, you were searching of some evolutionary mechanism to try this, which is the natural selection through this long process, and your cart's empty, it doesn't work. So what happens then, if such observations contradict the theory's predictions, it may be revised, or it can be discarded if an alternative better explains the observed facts. For example, Newton's theory of gravitation was replaced by Einstein's theory of general relativity when the, later, when the latter was observed to more precisely predict the orbit of Mercury. So this happens, this happens in science, Okay, it's not something new, and it's something that probably should have happened. So you know, the question is, you know, it should have basically gone into the recycling <coughs> bin at this time. But instead, what we see is 